Well, my name is Brian Willie. I am the offensive coordinator and offensive line coach at Fairmont High School in Fairmont, Minnesota. I've been in that role since 2017. I'm also a high school social studies teacher uh, at Fairmont High School as well. So today we're going to talk a little bit about A-gap power. Um, A-gap power is something that we at Fairmont really have only been majoring in for about 18 months, to be honest with you. Uh, we've been predominantly a C-gap uh, power GT slash GH counter team for the most of my career here. Uh, but once we started to dabble a little bit in A-gap power, we started to find a lot of really good compliments that it could really provide our offense and also provide um, our kids an opportunity to do something a little bit different um, to really maximize their skill set. Um, just a couple of things in case anybody wants to get a hold of me or has any questions about this uh, presentation. I'm an open book. Uh, you got my Twitter handle here, um, as well as my email there that if you guys need anything, just reach out a question. I'd be happy to to network with you a little bit and, and give back as much as I possibly can. So why A-gap power? Well, for us, uh, the big thing that we really were looking for when we got into A-gap power was an inside physical running play. For many years, we had done a little bit and dabbled with, with inside zone and uh, we just don't have the personnel to make inside zone work for us. Uh, we don't have a lot of guys that can really get physical displacement vertically on a consistent basis uh, with double teams at, at the point of attack. And so we have a lot a lot of times really majored in gap schemes. And so a gap power really when it was introduced to us fit really, really well with our scheme. Uh, the guy who we first got it from is who I feel is the best in the business, which is North Dakota state. Uh, AJ Blazik was a guy I got to, to meet and, and network with a little bit at a clinic. I followed that up by uh, meeting with uh, Scott Fuchs uh, over in Buffalo right now. And then also talked to Bart Miller when he was over at Wyoming. And those guys really helped us put a gap power into a, a system that could really blend with our, our traditional C gap power. So the big reason we like it, it attacks the interior of the defense, a gap to a gap. Uh, it focuses on the first level defenders for our offensive linemen to get displacement on our pulling linemen aren't really worried about what's happening at the second level. We're worried about what we can get movement on, on the first level. Uh, and it causes misfits for our linebackers. You know, a lot of time we're going to run power 10 to 15 times a game. The linebackers are going to be taught to guard read. And the second they see that pull, they're going to be fitting hard off of B and C gap. And so now that we start you know, meshing in this, this A gap power play, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a second, it starts making them to have a little bit more heavy feet. And it also makes them overrun their aiming points every once in a while, which gives us a pretty big play in the run game. Um, so it all really kind of complements itself and it builds off one another to give us a really nice run play. But there is some limitations to it. You know, I got to be honest with you. You got to get movement up front. And although you got angles and, and gap scheme seems to be a little bit more tenable than, you know, inside zone in terms of getting movement, there is sometimes a problem getting movement level one because you need a certain type of movement, uh, which we'll talk about here a little bit more. We are more of a lateral movement, A gap power team. Uh, we really want to get that movement from the A and B gap cleared so we can run in that uh, play side A gap. <clears throat> it's best run versus a four front. And for the most part of my career here in Fairmont, we saw predominantly four and five front teams. This year, um, in the small amount of the season that we got, we saw predominantly three front. So um, three front, there's just so many more variables against A gap power that you gotta account for. I'll talk about a couple of them that we do, uh, but three fronts are just they're difficult for high school kids to understand all the different things you have to prepare for in a matter of four or five days. So uh, it is best run against the four front. And also we found it's best run with the H back or a fullback. Um, unless you wanna read it, which we dabbled with a little bit this year, and I'll show you some clips of how well that went, good and bad and otherwise. Um, you need an H back or a fullback to kick out that guy first outside the B gap. And so the biggest thing I can tell coaches right now is if you wanna get into A gap power, by all means do it, but it's an expensive play. You take a lot of time in practice, working on the certain types of double teams, all the different types of movements um, and the dynamic situations, because rarely do you get a static situation where you're gonna get a guy line up in a one and a three and everything goes according to plan. So as long as you take a lot of time and invest practice time in it, um, it's a very beneficial play, but it is very expensive. So let's first start with, when we teach this to our guys, we teach it in backside rules and play side rules. So I'm going to start with our backside rules and then kind of move on to the play side. And as I go into the play side, I'm going to talk about a few techniques uh, that we teach our guys as just teaching points that help them execute the scheme uh, to the best of their ability. And so the first thing we start with is our backside tackle guy. And in, whether it's we're running GT, whether we're running power, traditional or, or A-gap, it's a backside uh, hinge funnel. 
for our guys. So really nothing revolutionary there, really hard setting into the B gap, funneling anything we possibly can to the outside, waiting for our center to come up uh, and close up A gap. Just making sure there's no run through there um, and that our backside three technique or one technique, whatever we're getting backside isn't chasing the play down. Backside guard, we're going to spend a little bit more time here in a second talking about, but he's a square pull to the opposite A gap. He cannot go further than the play side A gap. And we'll talk a little bit why here in a second. But the one thing that you got to teach your guys right away, and this is something that our, our young guards struggle with this year particularly, is as your backside guard is pulling from backside to play side, his eyes are not at second level. His eyes are straight down the line of scrimmage at the play side double team that's going to be executed by our play side guard and tackle. He's also keeping his eyes down there just in case that is a successful double team down the line of scrimmage. He's then keeping eyes towards the fullback's kick out uh, in the B gap. And so once his eyes are down the line of scrimmage and he's focusing on that double team, that's going to dictate what he does next. If he gets movement successfully from our play side double team, he's going to clean up whatever fits off of A gap as he inserts into the play side A. If it's cloudy, or if there's any kind of a stalemate, he's going to do what's called a double bump, which I'll talk about here in a second. It's something, a you know, technique that the, the North Dakota State guys uh, really teach and emphasize with their players. So this shuffle pull by our puller, we tell our puller, you are the fixer. Okay, so as you are pulling from backside to play side A, your job is not to go get the play side linebacker, whoever fills in the A gap. Your job is to fix whatever is broken on the play side. So the first thing we tell them is you need to have square shoulders keep your hips square as you're going from A gap to A gap. And it's like a slow crawl. And you'll see that in the film that I'm going to show you. We have to tell our guys to slow down because if you start fitting outside of A gap into the B gap, you're going to overrun all the different angles that we are looking for and are trying to execute. And you're going to see linebackers insert there and you're not going to have a very productive run play. So we tell our guys to be really, really slow and deliberate with a square pull with square shoulders and square hips almost 1,001, 1,000 insert. That's basically what it times out to for a lot of our guys, but it's different for each player. So as this fixer mindset, as they're coming out, if they're seeing a stalemate from our play side guard and play side tackle, they're trying to move this double team and it's not clearing the play side A gap, which is what their aiming point is. Play side tackle, play side guard, ideally is getting a lateral double team to clear the play side A gap. And our puller is gonna fit tight off of that double team, tight off the tackle. If that doesn't happen and there's a stalemate there, we tell our guard to make a pile and chip with the same foot, same shoulder and get kind of like a, I don't know if you want to call it a flipper, but some sort of a displacement that helps stand up that blocker, or excuse me, that defender that allows them to place a guard and place a tackle to start moving him vertically. And basically when we get any kind of a double bump or um, stalemate there, our place or our running back is basically knowing that he's going to get a one to two yard gain, that he's going to follow the inside hip of this uh, puller, and he's just going to make a wall and try to fall forward uh, the best that we can. The big thing with the guard that we tell him, though, as you are going down the line of scrimmage, you cannot get spilled. If you get spilled by any kind of movement, whether it's going to be a slanting defensive tackle or a blitzing linebacker, the play is going to be nothing. So we make sure that he knows that he cannot get spilled anything inside and he's needs to wash down and make sure that he gets uh, as much clear um, of a lane for a running back as possible. So this double bump technique is kind of what I talked about a little bit before, but that's it. The play side tackle, like I said, and the play side guard do not get a double team down the line of scrimmage or if our fullback is fitting out of the B gap and all of a sudden now he is stuck um, with either a slanting defensive end or a blitzing linebacker. If that guy is stuck as well, we also use a double bump technique. Again, tell your guys as you're staying square, just use near foot, near shoulder. So if you're going to the right and I got my left guard pulling, he's shuffle, shuffle, and he sees down the line of scrimmage that he's got a stalemate, he's going to use then his right shoulder and his right foot. He's going to get it, his foot in the ground, almost like it's blocked to struct to a certain like defensive end or outside linebacker, he's going to try to get movement to get the pad level up of that defender and then hopefully move that person vertical. Uh, if things are cloudy where you're not sure, okay, well, is he getting movement? Is he not? Which happens a lot in high school football where players just fall down by accident. They're not very athletic and it just doesn't look like you know what to do. We tell our guys, just make a wall and get vertical. But again, you cannot get outside the A gap. If you start drifting in B gap, you're creating all sorts of seams for the linebackers to get through. So a couple of techniques then we teach our play side tackle to execute this double team. The first thing we tell him is he has to stay flat. 
If he starts to go vertical at any point, what you're going to see with our film, you create an opportunity to get split. And at the same time, you're now going to have that double team start to drift vertical as well. And that backside linebacker, if he's pressing, his read key is probably going to get underneath that double team. Um, and you're going to see a lot of times we don't have him accounted for because we're not worried about second level. So he's going to make that play for probably a one to two yard gain or possibly uh, a no, guard, no yard gain at all. So we tell him to stay flat to prevent any kind of run through. And then once his double team reaches the backside A gap, then he can reinforce vertically or do some sort of a turn back where he turns his shoulders around almost like a U-turn and gets anything that's coming through. More than likely at high school football, guys, you're not going to have that much time. Uh, if you get that much movement all the way down the line of scrimmage and your running back still hasn't got there, you got a problem. So uh, we don't really teach them that much. I mean, they talk about it at NDSU and Wyoming and all the other places that they've run it, um, but we don't really teach much to turn back because we have enough problem getting movement on the double team as it is. We always tell our tackle to keep his head in front of the linebackers. And so as he's getting everything down the line of scrimmage, if he sees any kind of run, a linebacker trying to push through, you're going to try to work that double team, keep your head in front of it in order to try to force that linebacker to run over top. Anytime you can get a defender to run over top in A-gap power, it's good for us because now we're keeping it so tight to the line of scrimmage that hopefully he overruns and tries to have to make a tackle in a phone booth, diving at ankles. And we tell our, our running backs, you got to be able to get through ankle tackles, especially if this play is going to be any kind of successful. The other thing we tell our tackle, and this is kind of something that the NDSU guys say, this is a very key point in the teaching progression for the tackle to execute this lateral movement that you're looking for at the down block. And that's what he's called as a skate step. Now, in order to get the skate step to work, your tackle has to adjust his stance a little bit. Some tackles do this anyway, um, but we tell our tackles sometimes they have to adjust it a little bit. They have to make sure their outside foot is outside of their hip. So if I'm a right tackle, my right foot has got to be outside of my hip. And I tell our tackles, pretend they're like a pitcher in a baseball game. That right foot, you got to have the weight distribution as if you got a pitcher on a pitching rubber. Okay, not as if you are getting ready to prepare to go in the windup, that as if you're in the stretch and you got that weight kind of distributed a little bit more on the inside heel. So that way, the second you get the snap, you can uh, push off that back foot and get as much lateral movement as possible. And that is something you have to teach our players. Because a lot of times our guys want to pick up that outside foot, put it back down and then use and try to execute that gallop technique with the inside foot, um, with their inside knee kind of stay, you know, get vertical movement that way. Um, so when we're doing the skate step, it takes a little bit more time to practice for our guys and just doing board drills uh, over and over and over again will help reinforce that uh, behavior by the player. Inside foot, just steps. Okay? Either you have our player step up, you know, pick up your foot, put, put it back down. Our guys, a lot of times will pick it up and just bring it just slightly towards the inside so they can get a little bit more force uh, pushing off that back foot. But we tell them in terms of their hand placement, we want to place their inside hand on the back of the guard. What that does, is it closes down any kind of, of option for that defensive lineman, try to split the double team. At the same time, it helps turn their shoulders to get that lateral movement that we want downhill. Because if they don't put that hand on the back side of the, the guard, a lot of times what happens is they continue to move vertically. And you're going to see that again with our film. Because the film I'm going to show you is us doing it wrong and us doing it okay. Because I don't think we're doing it great or, or mastering it yet. There's a lot of growth we got to have with it. But there is a lot of teaching that can be, doing, be shown by the things that we do wrong. So get that inside hand on the back of the guard that you're double teaming with. And then we tell them on their outside hand, aim for the hip of the down lineman that you're trying to move. And so you're going to bring that hip arm through as you're bringing through your force from that skate step. And it's like you're pushing off the pitching rubber, about ready to follow through on the pitch, but you're going to drive right on the inside hip and you're going to get movement that way. So then when we go now on the inside part of that double team, the play side guard, we tell them a couple of rules and then we give them a couple tips as well. Number one, never reach for a, a B-gap defender that's running away from you. Now, obviously, you're going to have a B-gap defender if you have a three technique and a four front. Um, that you are working on the inside half of the double team, like I'm going to explain here in a second. But if that three technique starts moving out and away from you, you never chase it. Just continue to solidify play side A-gap until you get to the backside A-gap and then move vertical. But if you have a three tech, we tell them to settle and stab and let the play side tackle bring the three tech to you. Don't lunge at him. Don't move laterally at him. Let the play side tackle bring him to you. A couple of reasons for that. If that play side tackle, or excuse me, if that three technique is slanting outward and away from you, there's probably somebody coming in the A gap one way or another, whether it's a nose or whether it's a blitzing linebacker, somebody's going to be filling there. So you're still got gap responsibilities. You're still responsible for play side A gap. 
just like the plate side tackle is responsible for plate side B gap. So we tell them if you see anything going away, stay put. Let the tackle bring anything towards you. But when you have a three technique and if he's executing his block properly as the play side tackle, he's going to bring that guy to you. And so you want your outside foot then to take a bucket step as a play side guard, have your inside foot stab for a second. And then what you want to do is you want to take your, your outside hand, which if you're the right guard is your right hand, left guard, left hand. And you want to reach and try to lift the inside armpit of that down lineman hopefully getting him moving upwards and getting his pad level up, then corresponding with the play side tackle hitting the hip, you're gonna get a lot of movement down line. Um, and then hopefully from that point, once you get that play side tackle bringing that down line and to you, you then will help shift your momentum and help him clear play side A gap all the way to backside A. If you get a one technique or a zero tech and there's nobody to your side, just do exactly what the play side tackle was taught. Use your skate step, through play side A gap all the way through back side A gap. And now the center would execute what the play side guards technique is in terms of a bucket step, stab, and then help move uh, through the back side A gap. Now, a couple things uh, I, I want to touch on here in terms of the technique of the play side guard. As he's uh, bucket stepping and then lifting the near armpit, we tell our guys to finish like almost like you're turning your arm over. And the reason why we do it is as he's turning his arm over, hopefully he's also turning the pad level of the, the down defender. And that helps with the movement from the play side tackle. If we just help them just lift, a lot of times our guys lift and we get the initial surge to get the, the, the down lineman's pad level up, but then we just kind of roll off it. We don't really execute the block from there. So as he grabs the inside armpit, we tell him to turn it over because it just, for whatever reasons with our guys, it helps them then move their shit, move their shifting of their mindset to a turning of the, the pads to help get that lateral movement that we're looking for. If you get a two tech, we tell our guys to still try to use the exact same kind of uh, mindset that you would with a three technique in terms of let the tackle bring him to you. But we tell them in terms of like your, your bucket step and your, your stab, try to aim with your eyes and your arms through the core of the defender. By the time you make contact, our tackle will either bring him through or that person will have slanted in front of you and then you will wash him down and it'll just take you to where you need to be. So at any time during any of this with a play side guard, guard, if you get a blitzing linebacker to threaten the A-gap, whether you got a three tech or a two tech, you're still, your trump card of everything is still your responsibility in a gap scheme, which is A-gap. So if ever, ever you see any kind of blitzing linebacker with a double A pressure or anything like that, everything gets trumped. You take care of anything A-gap first. This is just if everything is static and you're getting proper movement. So, so then the center, his rules are just simply normal gap scheme rules, secure the backside A gap, prevent any kind of run through, and um, then also serve as the inside of the double team on any zero or one tech. And just like the play side guard, everything A gap trumps anything with the double team. The center has anything backside A gap will trump anything that's going on play side. So a couple things we want to talk about here before we go to the film. I just want to talk about movement by the defensive line. So these are rules we teach our guys at install so that way as we're breaking things down of a film of our opponent or seeing things in the course of a the game they know these kind of rules and what they should probably do in kind of reaction to it so if that play side three technique is loose or loops over the play side tackle like we talked about earlier leave him not only is the guard going to leave him the play side tackle is going to leave him as well and then we're just going to have that movement then from our play side tackle and guard really working on nobody securing play side A and then getting vertical. So it'll be lateral, then vertical, getting the play side linebacker. Now you might be wondering, well, well who's then gonna block that, that three technique that's looping over top? That's gonna be your fullback. As I'm gonna talk about here in a second, he's gonna fit off of the first thing that shows up outside of B gap. So as he's taking his path through B gap, if that defensive tackle is looping out, it's a really easy kick out block for him and then we're getting vertical, okay? If that play side or play side three technique is slanting straight at the play side tackle, we want to work a stalemate as best as we possibly can by standing him up as a play side tackle. Possibly, if if we can, try to turn him outward, and then that puller is going to be the fixer and double bump to get that movement vertical that we need. If that play side guard sees that tackle, or excuse me, the down lineman slanting at our tackle, he then continues on his path secures play side A gap to backside before working vertical to the near side linebacker. But again, just like our play side guard and our play side tackle, we can't allow any kind of spilling when that double bump comes. So if that double bump's gonna get any kind of displacement, we still then have to finish off almost like an inside zone double team uh, to work him vertically so that we got a path for our running back. 
If we get a two tech that loops the play side tackle, same things apply. If he goes over top of us, we leave him, work to the backside linebacker. If he engages right in our path, we try to work a stalemate until we get our puller to reinforce that double bump technique. And I can go through this more double bump technique if any of you guys want to. Just email me. I got plenty of drills uh, that you know Coach Miller from that's now at Illinois uh, has shared with me and also which Coach Blazik has shared as well. So play side guard, um, if that three technique loops towards play side tackle, again, just to reinforce, leave anything that's leaving the B gap from you, reinforce play side A to back side A, and then move vertical. Okay, so last thing I'm going to kind of talk about here before that I go show some diagrams and some film is three front. So when we get a three front, uh, the play side tackles rules might change a little bit based on the type of three front you're seeing. Do they slant a lot? Do they twist? Do they loop? If you're seeing a three front where this four technique or sometimes, you know, maybe playing a tight front, sometimes playing more of a wide front, uh, what we call it more of a, almost like a five technique. If they're sitting there and just kind of, if your normal C gap power or any kind of GT, they're just squeezing or buzzing their feet. If you see anything like that, just continue to work flat through the A gap and reinforce the backside linebacker. Any kind of buzzing of their feet and not many movement that's not committing one way or the other, we just tell our tackle, don't worry about it, get movement. Because by the time he's done buzzing his feet, our fullback should be through the play side B gap and should displace him anyway. So just sitting there dancing with him, you're going to make it hard for the play side, uh, or excuse me, you're going to make it hard for the full uh, the fullback to get his movement, and you're going to make it hard for the, the puller to really get a read of, do I need a double bump or do I need an insert vertical? So fullback, H-back, uh, doesn't care to me what you want to label it. We use a fullback a lot of times. Their rules is I'm going to line up somewhere in A gap or I'm going to line up somewhere backside, weak side A gap, and I'm going to fit first thing right outside of the B gap. So their path we try to teach them is to split the play side guard. Okay, split his butt crack, move through, and try to fit anything out that appears in the B gap. If something's not there, as you're entering the B gap, continue to work vertically through B gap and insert yourself on a linebacker or any kind of safety that's filling uh, downhill. Running back, we tell him, you, well, you're teaching him a lot like inside zone. It's play side A gap to back side A gap. So he's gonna insert play side A. And if he's got a, any kind of, of a scene there, he needs to run through daylight. Uh, one of the things that the North Dakota State guys talked about is it's gonna be cloudy sometimes. You gotta teach you guys, you gotta run like you're running through smoke and that eventually it will part. And you will see in some of the film, if our running back would have kept it tight a little bit longer, the, the seam would have, would, have, would have come. And that's something you have to teach these, these running backs at high school because a lot of them are going to see congestion and they're going to want to bounce the backside A gap. In this play, you got to make sure you know that if backside A is wide open, certainly take that cut. But otherwise, stay towards the hip of the polar and you're going to lead yourself to daylight. So play side A gap to backside A gap, that's kind of what we teach our running back. Okay, so this is just a diagram of if we had a static situation, this is how we would block it versus the forefront. So if you can see here, there's one guy right here that we do not have accounted for in our scheme. And that's by, it's by design. We really do not care uh, about these linebackers at the second level. We're all about the first level movement. When we play it here in, a lot of times in Southern Minnesota, we get a ton of teams that will play if we line up in you know, two by two spread, if we line up in, in a traditional pro set you see here, it's going to be a seven man box regardless. And so we're more of a spread like offense. And so everything has to be a numbers equation for us. So in this case, we got what we consider to be, you know, a balanced number set, you know, seven on seven. And so one of the things that we're going to do here is we're going to tell, you know, all of our guys up front, I've gone through their rules in terms of getting this lateral uh, movement here by our play side double team, moving it here to try to basically take this defender and run him through this backside A gap and make a, just a pile there where nobody can get through. Anything outside of that, you're going to see then kicked out here by our fullback outside of B. Now, they have a very loose, you know, like seven technique. Well, for our fullback then, he's going to be entering in B gap. If this guy comes and is the C gap defender, he's going to take him. If this linebacker comes through, he's going to take him. Somebody's going to show uh, as he goes through there. And then we're just telling our, our guy out here, our tight, tight end, this is a bonus block. We don't really want you playing around with this guy in terms of trying to drive him to the sideline because if he's making plays down the line of scrimmage here and a gap as fast as it hits, then we need to be running outside. We need to be running, you know, either a power scheme, uh, uh, you know, what we'd call buck sweep outside or just a toss scheme to get movement down that way. And we, we read this play enough where he doesn't like to go down the line of scrimmage. He just stays in his gap. And so what we'll tell our tight end in this, if you play with the tight end, 
chip and then get vertical. And then we're trying to get, that's what we call a touchdown block. Chip him, invite him to go outside, even two steps is perfect. And then try to go get the safety because that's gonna be the difference between us getting a touchdown and us not. Our hope then here is we're gonna have this guy either misfit it and try to run over top because he's gonna be seeing so much uh, you know, traditional power or he's gonna get caught in this mess as this double team's coming down here that we're gonna see a seam that's gonna be going vertical. So the first clip I'm gonna show you is actually gonna show you how it's done right by the people of North Dakota State. So I got a little bit of film here on them. They're just gonna show you one clip of them running it in 2019. And then I'm gonna show you us running it actually when we installed it. So you can see some of the errors that we made early on uh, before we ran it during the season. So here's just the, the wide view. Okay, I got a tight coming up here next, gonna be a little bit more um, of a better view for teaching purposes here. So as you see this, this forefront here, by North Dakota State here. So they're playing with what we consider a 21 personnel here. They're gonna bring this guy in motion. Get a little bit of, of different kind of stunting up front here. But here's the place we come here to the left. Focus here, right here is this tackle. You can see his foot is outside of his, of his hip like we talked about with the tackle's technique. And you can see kind of with his foot, it's angled just slightly. So that way he can use it like he's doing, he's in a pitching rubber and move flat down the line of scrimmage. Now there's something that you, he knows in the play, in, in the pregame, kind of going through the scouting report, what's going to happen with this guy. He can take a really, really flat path and you're going to see this defensive lineman slants right out here. And, and it's like this doesn't even phases him. It's like he ignores him and goes down because he's done so much film study that they like to go and do any kind of slanting and kind of movement that he knows that he can just trust that, that guy's going to be accounted for by this fullback. Watch this guard. You're going to see him slightly take up that inside foot and stab. You're going to see this bucket step slightly here and let this uh, double team be brought to him. But you're also going to see that this guy's going to slant out rather quickly and he's going to shift his eyes down here. Another thing you're going to see here at the center, although he's playing the inside part of what appears to be could, could possibly an inside double team between him and a, and a guard here, his eyes remain in the backside A gap at all times. So I'll just kind of start this here. First couple steps you can see here at the square pole. Get ready. So this guy's eyes are this backside a gap. You can see this guy right here is getting movement laterally. You can see this arm is in the backside of the guard, just like we talked about um, in our install here. And you can see his left arm, his outside arm here is. If there was a guy here, he'd be putting it right on the hip. And you can see him. He's not looking. You can see here in this next step, his eyes are right here down the line of scrimmage. And he's going to see that there is movement here. He doesn't know if this guy is, is the three technical guy movement or whatever. He sees that there's a double team getting executed here. And this fullback now is going to be the guy that he needs to get his eyes to. So that's what he's making his read off of. So as this guy comes down, sees it's a pretty good fit. And so now he's going to insert himself a gap. And he's going to get the first bad color that shows up. If it's this guy or a linebacker scraping over top, he's getting the first bad guy that shows up. And then it's the running back's responsibility to make the other guy miss in a phone booth. So here he sees him coming in um, as the first bad color. He just makes contact. Doesn't need to be a, you know, a pancake block. He just needs to make contact. And now the running back is off to daylight. And he makes a great play from that point forward. But just coming back here and seeing a couple things here again, you can see with this, this guard's footwork, okay? Takes a quick little bucket step back, inside foot stabs. And now he works vertical down the line, or excuse me, lateral down the line of scrimmage. What he here, probably would need to do in hindsight is probably get this outside arm a little bit more on the inside hip. He's a little bit high, but since this play side tackle is coming down the line of scrimmage because this guy looped out, now you get basically a three on one block and you're going to clear that play side A gap. Worst case scenario, you're hoping for, you know, a one to two yard gain off of this. Um, best case scenario, you're hitting it for, for six, which he does here. So here's what, this is day one of us teaching it. Okay, so we're in our 21 personnel here. There's a couple things you can already see that is going to be wrong um, by our, our team here. Number one, our fullback's alignment. He's so tight here that if he wants to go through B gap, he's going to have to almost all the way go through here to go through and insert here. Now, granted, this kid is an eighth grader. Yeah, I said it right. He was an eighth grader. Uh, we needed him to fill in this year for us. He's a phenomenal football player, but he did help out in practice. And so um, he's helping out here. If he is lining up a little bit more here, this block is going to be a lot easier for him. Um, with our movement. So that's the number one thing that we have. Number two, the splits here by our guard, way too wide, which is going to make any kind of movement or, or slant from a, a linebacker who's going to be filling here a lot more successful. 
Um, it also makes his technique here a little bit more difficult, even though he widened this three technique way outside here. So as we start here, our backside guard, you can see does an okay shuffle. But the problem here is with, with this guy being so wide, this guy being misaligned, this double team becomes more vertical and it opens up this lane for this linebacker to fill. And you can see it rather early on when we do this. I just kind of let it go here. Oops, sorry about that. You just let it go here. Our linebacker sees the, the gap open here and he fills and he's going right there uh, for tackle for loss. Now, if this guy stays tighter, which he should, he should insert vertically here. And since this guy is a first threat to, to a gap, he should block him. But if these guys are doing their job, better stance, everything's executed better, this double team would be occupying this space and this guy wouldn't be allowed to run through. Now you can see our tackle, he does have good stance. His hip and his, or his foot is outside of his hip. He gets his hand on the backside of the guard and he's trying to get movement there. And they get a pretty good job uh, of lateral movement, but with the fullback not fitting tight off this B gap, which would have eventually probably accounted for him. And this guy is our puller fixing, getting a little bit too wide. It creates an opening then for the linebacker to fill and doesn't really go anywhere. Now, one thing I'm gonna tell you, we were messing around day one with alignments. A gap power is tough when you have the back offset. We like him a lot better uh, in the pistol right behind. Just that way we can run it either way. We don't get as much of a key for our, um, for our defense. So this is now about a week later that we're running this. Um, and one of the things we, we do as a check with our quarterback when we run A gap power is we haven't count the box. And so, for example, here we're in our a slot formation. We only got uh, what I'm telling our quarterback, you got six guys to block with. Well, he's counting seven guys in, in the box. And so anytime he sees a numbers disadvantage and we don't have it read or we don't have a read tag on, we tell him that the quarterback then becomes the ball carrier and you have now this full or this running back becomes the extra blocker. So that's how we equal out numbers. And so here, what would traditionally be an A-gap power, he's checked and made a check call to the running back and said, hey, I'm going to keep this thing. And now the running back is going to fill and be, basically become an extra fixer um, through the B-gap for a quarterback. So you can see here, good original stance here by our play side tackle. Again, fullback here is just, he's aligned too far out in the B gap. So even a week later, we're, we're misaligning ourselves and he should be right here. But you can see we've got a walked up out or walked up middle linebacker. So now everything is checked into our gap scheme checks here for our guards. So our guards now, he's, remember everything that trumps in the play side A gap, he's gonna be going there. Play side tackle now is gonna be here. And if our, our fullback is aligned properly, he's gonna work through here to the first side guy who presents himself, which is more than likely gonna be this defensive end. We'd have our running back fill for the play side linebacker. We'd have our, our center backside A, a tight pull here, which would likely be for this backside linebacker. Everything's schooled up, everything should work. Well, as things go here, that I'm situation, everything up front by these guys is pretty good. Our puller though gets too wide and watch what happens when he gets too wide. If this play side line or this backside linebacker is good at filling, he's probably going to come right here and we're going to get the play stopped unless our running back can pick it up uh, a little bit sooner. But since he goes a little bit wider than he needs to, although our quarterback makes a good play, it shouldn't have ever got that point. Our, our, our puller should have fit here for the backside linebacker. Our running back should have been our lead here, and we should have had everything schooled up in terms of, of body on body. So now this is blocking versus a three front. This is where you can do a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, if you got really good guys here at the tight ends position, there's going to be times where if you really, really want to, you can take this tight end and take this tackle and basically try to wash this defensive end all the way through play side A gap. At that point to me, it becomes traditional power. So we never, if it's getting to that point, we don't call it a, cut, a gap power. We just call traditional C gap power. So that is not a variation that I'll teach our guys. If, if we're going against this type of a look, um, whether it's an Oki look or whether it's a bear front, whatever, the variations that we're going with, we're going to tell our tackle, assume it's like a three technique that's slanted towards you. So we want you to get a stalemate as much as you possibly can, unless he loops over the top, welcome that as much as you possibly can. But we want to get a stalemate as much as we possibly can, get a double bump here, and then have our fullback insert through B gap and basically try to insert on the play side linebacker. A lot of times what we will see is when we go with that mindset, this tackle sets hard with his inside foot 
because he's not ex executing a skate step anymore. It's just basically almost like an inside zone set. He's an inside uh, set for this um, defender. And a lot of times he will take the, the path of re least resistance, go outside. And now our fullback then fits off a of B gap, just like his rules tell him. And then our tackle just works vertically to the play side linebacker and it works the same way. So we got two for two accounted there at all times. Now this play side guard and center um, get movement laterally towards the backside a gap before moving it vertical um, because we get a lot of slanting by noses if the nose slants over top we again this keeps our debt our double team lateral but if he slants weak then our play side guard fills play side a and, and works the back the backside middle linebacker nothing changes for our backside tackle he's still hinge back or still hinge blocks and we still got our uh, tight end still as the bonus block and d gap so here's again, North Dakota State running it versus a three front. I'm with tight view here in a second. So you can see here, it doesn't really matter how they align. They just trust the rules with their eyes and their point of attack and everything just works out according to plan for them. So as they get to right here, you can see just in terms of alignment again, foot outside uh, of the hip, you can see it's good, kind of a, a little bit of a twisted foot there a little bit so to get him the lateral movement. Then you can see when this guard pulls here, his eyes immediately go down the line of scrimmage, looking at this double team right here. So in this case, they have a guy or a team that plays a little bit more of a loose technique, kind of what we talked about before, guys who buzz their feet or want to squeeze and read, he just forgets about them. That's probably a game plan thing that they talked about. So the fullback just fits. And here it looks really, really congested. It looks tight. But if you just stay patient, it goes from now play side A gap, which seems full. There's a backside A gap that's open, makes a cut. And now he goes. Now, this is what we're talking about with like the second line defender in terms of misfit in here. He's seeing pull. So he's coming all the way down here. We don't need a great block here. We just need to make, him make, him make contact. He just runs himself out of the play because he's so used to them running traditional power. He's so used to them running, you know, whether it be their, their, their outside, their, their, their G scheme of sorts, that he is unsure of his, of his reads. And he's not even, you know, playing downhill all that fast here. He's not, he's kind of still reading, shuffling, not 100% sure. And now we make contact and, and you get an opportunity for a big play. And that's why we like A-gap power. It's just such a nice complement to what we do uh, with our, our normal power scheme. So here, this is game one for us. Um, so because of the pandemic, we didn't get our first game till late October um, for us. And so we played a team that plays a lot of a three front. So in this, uh, we talked about how if you have our quarterback here, you can numbers or box count. If you see them having seven to our, our six, the quarterback can run it. Well, this week, we didn't want to do that. Um, just because we just didn't think we can move these guys to the point of attack. And so we didn't matter if we had an equal number count. We wanted to read more often than, than we couldn't. Um, and so in this case, we have a read on. And in order for us to read a defender here, we always like to, when we do it, uh, get one of these outside linebackers or alley defenders in conflict with motion. Um, we'll pair our A-gap power with some play action stuff, which I'd be happy to talk to you guys with at another time. Um, but in this case, you'll see us bring our wide receiver in motion. And this is just our, th uh, our three down rules. Our tackle is telling himself, I want a stalemate. If he goes down, I'm going to wash him. If he goes out, I'm going to leave him. Fullback, I'm going to come across. Now, context of his play, the play before this, our starting fullback went down. And that eighth grader that I talked about that we were in practice with, he's now inserted for his first varsity football game here. And so he's getting all this a lot uh, in, in short Time. So he was more comfortable coming across the formation and almost hugging um, the, the guards, the, the fixer or the pullers uh, pull. Um, but in this case, he even aligns outside of it. And so he kind of realizes that as the play is going in motion, he tries to make up for it. But just note, he should be, if he's lining properly to the left of our uh, center here and should be inserting in play side B gap. But it works out okay here. So as they get this, and this is where we want the snap and we run it with motion, we want this kind of I don't know if you want some misdirection to it, because this is how we'll run our jet off of it as well. We'll run our, our jet series, then give uh, a gap off this way as well. Because when we run our jet, we'll block it just like a gap power to give the illusion for the middle linebackers out here as well. And so this motion holds this play side linebacker out here. So even though we don't have our, our kick out by our fullback, he's taken care of. And now our, our running back inserts a gap, 
he sees that it's a little bit full. And if he would have kept it tight, you can see our puller who's right here, which I'll show you a little bit better at the tight. He probably gets a couple more yards, but he just feels a little more, more comfortable bouncing it and we get a nice four or five yard game. So this isn't the greatest uh, view here. Um, note it's about 20 degrees, so our film is a little bit sketchy here. But our tackle here sees that this guy's lined up inside of him. So he's assuming I'm going to execute the skate step here. And as he sees any kind of slant, he's able to, to get displacement here. Now our, our, our puller here, he's coming around and this, this takes a little bit longer to clear the place that A gap because he's coming for, from such a long ways away. Our guy needs to keep working around this double team before inserting. Now he inserts a little bit too soon and that's what makes our, our running back a little bit squeamish. And so he gets outside a little bit too early. And so now you can see our, it's tough to see here. I apologize for that, but our, our fixer is right here. And here is the, the seam that he could have potentially run through, uh, but he bounces it and gets outside here a little bit. So now later on in the game, we're running in the red zone. I'm just going to skip to the tight right here. And our fullback, again, he's aligned a little bit too far to the outside. And if he's right here, it's going to be a lot easier of a block to kick out for him. When we got down to the red zone, we had a good feeling that this guy is going to be the B-gap defender. So we told our tight end, work to this outside linebacker and then work vertically. And we told our fullback, you need to get the outside linebacker. So I know he was thinking to himself, based off of the scouting report, I'm probably not getting this defensive end so I can get my alignment out a little bit further. We still don't want him to cheat that way. Start tighter and then work uh, more laterally outside if you could. But you can see here, we get a stalemate here. Our guy comes tight off the point of attack and we go through. Our guard does not execute the proper technique here. He's still supposed to be working laterally here with the center to get this nose out of the way for our play side A gap. But he, for whatever reason, saw him slant and shift out to a one technique. And so he all of a sudden thought it was a forefront. So he checks into the forefront rules, says I'm the inside guy, the double team. So you can see here, picks up his foot, does the bucket step, tries to lift. And then we got our guard fitting over here. So for like the, for our guys here, we just gotta be make sure that we're, we're disciplined knowing what rules we do. do we, are we doing three rules or four rules? Um, and sometimes we have our four, you know, our, our center call out what rules we have 30 or 40. Um, but in this case, it was our first game of the season. You know, I thought our guys were doing a pretty good job for it. We can see it hits pretty tight. So some variations here as I kind of close things down here. Things we dabbled with. This isn't something that, that North Dakota State taught us. This isn't anything else that we learned from anybody else. It's just stuff that, that we took the rules that they, they taught us and we tried to apply them to our situation. So like I said before, in Southern Minnesota, we could be lined up here in what we would consider a spread set two by two and teams aren't gonna give us a six man box. We're gonna be seven man box playing cover zero um, or cover one. Um, I can't really cover one, excuse me, uh, cover four. And they're going to basically say, try to beat us in the box. And so one of the things we want to do is we still want to run the football out of these sets. And so we have to find a way to equal out the numbers in the box. Well, most of the time when we're in a two by two set like this, if we're going against a seven man box, if we read a guy, it at least gets us down to a six man box. Well, now if we read it and motion a guy, hopefully we can take care of two guys, depending on their motion rules to make it an even box for us. And so this is how we would draw up our, our uh, a gap read with our quarterback. And our quarterback is typically going to be reading the defensive end. If the defensive end collapses and chases this a gap power, he's going to keep off the end, which basically is like a lead blocker. here. You see the Ravens kind of do some stuff like this with their C gap power series. Um, so this guy becomes a, a, the H in this case becomes a lead blocker off the edge for us. Typically the, the corner, we don't account for the corner a lot of times in our blocking schemes. Uh, we make him make most of the tackles if we can, especially on an A-gap run play. He just more than likely isn't going to be making the play a lot of times unless our quarterback's keeping it. And so uh, we leave him a lot of the times in this, but also then we run our play action stuff off this where we'll run this up front. He'll run you know, an arrow route out, out, of the bot, out of the end of it. We'll run a slip screen. He becomes the, the lead blocker out to the corner. I mean, we can do a lot of different stuff off of it out of this formation. So Here's us again, this is about probably uh, week two of practice, us putting this in. The problem is we're going against our defense in a competition period here. So our defensive coordinator knows what I wanna do here. And so he checks in to cover zero and has the, the safeties follow him here. So no matter what, we're gonna be minus one in the box here. But I wanna show you kind of what, what we are aiming to do here 
in the box. So it doesn't go well for us here, but the goal for the scheme here is he should be snapping it right now. He snaps it late because we hadn't made the adjustment yet. And so that allows us to actually bring another defender into the box um, for all of this. But our quarterback is reading this defensive end, just like, a, you know, your, your veer scheme. If he comes up field, he's going to give it. If he goes wide, he's going to keep it. Now you can see our scout linebackers aren't, aren't filling it, you know, not trusting their reads. But you can see here our tackle executes the, the skate step pretty well. It's a hand in the back. He's a little high with his technique, but we solidify a gap. And so what the hope is that with this, there's so much congestion here. This backside linebacker either has to run over top or he has to try to go through the congestion to make the tackle. Best case scenario, he makes a tackle right here for four yard gain. That's a lot of times why when you see me draw this up, I don't account for him. I don't think he's going to be a threat. In it. We've been proven wrong by that a couple of times, but we're willing to die on that hill. It's this middle linebacker that we got to worry about a lot of times. And that's what our polar, if everything's going well, is going to account for. This play side linebacker, we are hoping is going to be accounted for by this motion man. And then it becomes one-on-one -on -one with us reading this defensive end properly and us giving the, the, the running back the, the opportunity to make a play here. But our running back, the one thing he does here is he hugs the, the hip of the guard here, nice and tight, inside hip, which is what the one he wants to hug. And he gets a three, four yard gain for us, which is all we want. So this is now a little bit later uh, on in practice, the day after. He snaps it a little bit late again, but now hopefully we're trying to influence this linebacker. He doesn't be, or he isn't influenced by this, but let's just imagine he in this instance goes and plays our running back. Then what we're gonna have is our, our receiver blocked here. Oops. And then what we're hopefully, um, once the receiver is blocking there, we will have then this receiver come up for here. So we'll then on the perimeter be pretty much schooled up for everything, but he gives it here. Our running back number one gets too wide. So our, our, our pulling guard here, you can see does a really nice job staying in A gap to A gap. Our double team here again is too vertical. And you can see here, since it's too vertical, this guy here could get through if he really, really read the, the, the play correctly. Our running back is too wide. If he's hugging this inside hip, it's going to hit late. So watch, if he was keeping this tight, I understand the, the, the snap was a little off, a little high. But if he keeps this tight and he hugs it right downhill, just long enough, it's going to open right there. That's kind of what we have to teach a guy in terms of you're running through smoke, and then there is your one-on-one -on -one with the safety. Since he goes too wide here, even if we read this properly and the defensive end doesn't make the play, he's going to make the play. This linebacker is going to fill and it's not going to be for a, a very much of a game. So that's why those little teaching points have to be executed over and over again. That's why this makes it such an expensive play. So this is our last game of the season that we played. Uh, since we didn't have much of a playoffs here uh, in Minnesota, we were it was kind of like a bowl game, if you, if you will. This team was able to play us. Uh, we were really thankful for them taking us in to play this. But we saw that one of the things early on in the game when we were playing in them that we noticed is that they were running with a lot of our motion. <clears throat> so then we thought this wasn't a very good scheme. Well, then we saw them passing it all off. And so we thought to ourselves, oh, well, let's run the, the read scheme off of it. So you can see here, they're passing everything off. The motion's going to hold this defender here. Our receiver here is going to block for this defender, this outside linebacker. And we're going to read this defensive end here. So as we go through, we get a, a stalemate here. And our, our puller here, if he was reading this properly, it would double bump it. But since there was nothing to double bump because both of our guys were just stuck in a, a, a stalemate, he continues on vertically in A-gap, fits with the first bad color that shows up, and our running back stays tight for a five-yard gain. But you can see here, the motion takes care of this defender. The defensive end is frozen by the read, and we're able to get a seam there for a couple-yard gain. I had the tight view here, but our camera wasn't really working all that well that night. So it's not really worth showing you because it's so far out. So here, one of the things our, our center doesn't do a very good job of is checking into his rules. He sees a blitzer and a gap. He should be checking into, okay, well, I got backside a gap, play side guard. You got the, the, the one technique and everything should be moved down one. Well, we don't make that communication. And so we actually leave the middle linebacker coming free here, but you can still see here, now we're just bringing motion from the outside guy. Although he's chasing it here, these guys here are still widening. 
And because the play side guy overruns it, we get a nice, nice gain here off the play. So, you know, uh, that's just kind of our variations out of it. I have other variations, you know, certainly that we, we run off of a three front. I'll show you one here quick. Um, but there's a lot of things you can do with a, a three front. If you want to, you can block this end here, try to do some read stuff with him. I wouldn't recommend it. Again, now you're just getting into, you might as well get into C gap power. Um, you can you know, arc release this guy and invite him inside and try to keep for your quarterback. You can try to kick him out and keep the quarterback tight. There's a lot of different variations you can run off of a three front. Here's one that I'll show you. Uh, versus this team, this team was a 3-3 stack team, gave us a ton of uh, trouble with our A-gap scheme just because they had so much slanting um, from their defensive tackles and defensive ends. So I'm actually going to get to the tight view here. Um, I think here it gets to the end. Right here. So what we did in this case, this is one of our variations, we decided, well, with all the slanting, we told our tackle, take the defensive tackle no matter what. If he goes out, then obviously leave him, um, and then we'll kick him out um, with, or not kick him out, we'll leave him and then have our fullback kick him out. So we're actually reading what I'd consider a dog out here. Um, he's going to be our read key. And so hopefully we would get a double team this way here. This guy would insert vertically on um, one of the stacked linebackers. Guard, uh, and play side guard and center would be getting movement on this nose. Our fullback or excuse me, our backside guard would be inserting place at A-gap for first bad color that shows. This play side fullback is fit and still B-gap to anything that's in his way. And then now we are bringing this backside fullback as our plus one defender to keep on the, on the quarterback. Now for this one, it's third and two. I told our quarterback, I want you to design keep it. We had run this play twice already and they had stuffed um, our running back on it both times. And so I figured on this one, no matter what, they're probably going to stuff it again. Please keep it. And so it really wasn't much of a read here. But since he slants down, you can see now everybody's going through. Fullback is fitting the first guy out of B-gap. Since this guy was buzzing his feet, he considers him more of a threat. So he blocks out here. Our quarterback's read is still right here. Again, if he was truly reading it, since he wasn't moving, he should be given this thing uh, and us getting as many yards as possible. But if he gives it, this guy's probably getting tackled by the backside guy here. Since we called it a design keep, here's now our plus one out of this set. And our quarterback's able to pick up the first down. And we don't execute our blocks here play side the proper way. Again, we got a long way to come from our offense in this way, but it's just another variation you can do in terms of a read scheme when you're trying to equal out numbers. So again, you know, I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to come on here and talk some mega app power. I by no means am an expert on this. I just have been fortunate enough to have been taught by what I consider to be the experts of this, the guys from North Dakota State um, and that coaching tree. And so we're 18 months in. I'm hoping we're better uh, in our execution of this 18 months from now. But I'm happy to share with you guys any of the notes that I have, any of the constraint plays we have off of this, because um, I really believe the A-gap power when you run it with your you know, your power scheme for your, your C-gap and B-gap power or even your GT counter scheme, it's such a nice complement that really causes a lot of headaches for, for linebackers to fit.